Welcome everybody to Indie Live Extra. We have one of our regular guests on today. It's uh, Bill Ramsey, who, as you probably know, is SNP, Scottish CND. He's a member of the EIS trade union. I've always enjoyed talking to Bill Ramsey on on these programmes. And this time um, he contacted us to to ask if he could come on to speak. And and, um, his, his particular concerns and thinking at the moment is all about the effects of having a war zone which has nuclear power stations in it um, and, and how that's treated by the by the two sides in, in, in the war. So, uh, yeah, here he is. It's been a while since we've um, caught up with you, Bill. So what's going on? Yeah, well, there's been a lot of developments um, in the, the, the war in Ukraine since we last spoke. Um, and there are a number of nuclear ailments. I mean, one of the reasons why I think it's worth having a conversation about this at this time is that a week or two ago, a very important development took place, which has not been covered very much by uh, the media in in the UK, has been covered in in other countries, has been covered in the United States, and it is the the most senior military uh, professional in the United States, uh, General Mark Milley, who is the chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff of the United States, and I'll say a little about what that means in a moment. Um, caused a bit of ruffling of feathers about a week or two ago when he said that it's time to um, start to talk about some sort of conflict resolution. He was speaking particularly after after the Ukrainians had recaptured the city mm. and regional centre of Kherson um, and the Russians are now in the southern side of the, the river Dnieper and as people will have seen in television in certain areas the, the Dnieper is a very very wide ri- a river with the Ukrainians capturing Kershaw, he then started to speak in semi-public about conflict resolution. And that caused some ruffling of feathers, particularly among, interestingly, the politicians. And the, the, the irony is, so you've got, now you've got the head, the most senior military figure in the United States, the, the chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, saying it's time to talk about some, some sort of resolution. And a few weeks before him, a former chair of the Joint Chiefs, this time a four-star admiral, a Michael Mullen, who is an admiral and was um, a chair of the Joint Chiefs, I think of it, I can't maybe 10 years ago, maybe a bit less, he was talking about conflict resolution. So you now get an interesting situation where two of the current and one of recently the most, the, the most senior uh, people in the American Armed Forces is talking about conflict resolution. Now, to be chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, let me explain what that means. In the United States, there are there are a number of services. There's the Navy, there's the Army, there's the Air Force, there's the Marine Corps, and there's the Coast Guard. The United States Coast Guard is the size of some navies. And the heads of them come together in a committee and advise the president. Uh, the heads of each of those are all four-star level generals or admirals. And uh, the chair of that is the principal um, professional military advisor to the United States President, who under the Constitution is Commander in Chief. And I think now we'll see more people, I mean, you've had two three star generals in Britain as well, starting to talk about conflict resolution. And uh, I think that's very important. So we're now moving into a new phase. Now, I'm talking about us in Scotland, in the UK, in the wider world, um, because uh, there is also the nuclear dim- uh, dimension as well. A household name for most people who even have a cursory interest in what's going on in the Ukraine is Zaporizhia, and in particular the nuclear power station in Zaporizhia. Now, the actual town of Zaporizhia is in actually the north side of the river Dnieper, but the power station, and it's a big industrial complex and a town near it, it is in the southern side of the river Dnieper and is therefore in Russian hands. And this and the um, what's been happening there is really important for a number of reasons. Even yesterday, there were reports about um, allegedly either the, the, the Russians or the Ukrainians firing artillery into it. And I'll say a little about that in a minute. But there's also something even bigger one of the supposed, and it is debated, solutions to the climate case that is now inevitable is green nuclear power. 
and companies like BA, I think it's the, the, that's the company, are talking, promoting quite uh, quite uh, aggressively. Small and nukes in a box, as I'll call them, another nuclear power station, smaller nuclear power stations that can produce compared to the size well, size power stations a bit cheaper. And we're talking now about a potential. People are talking about a potential solution to the energy crisis is nuclear power, and not just the energy crisis caused by the war, but the energy crisis uh, that's going to be caused as a result of mitigations in relation to climate chaos. And yet, if that happens, that is potentially in and of itself quite dangerous. And I'll, just, I'll go on maybe and say a little about that now. If you have a nuclear power station in a what would normally be called a, a so-called conventional non-nuclear war, the only way it could remain have no nuclear dimension is if there was a virtual diplomatic yellow tape put around the whole complex. But when you think of that, it becomes almost incredible because the idea of having a nuclear power station in a conflict zone raises a whole series of issues. And the Zaporizhia power station has put them into the public domain for the first time. Now, it's, now these nu nuclear power stations have been with us for decades. And one of the first interesting features is the fact that there's been very little discussion around the impact of nuclear power stations on war fighting, full stop. Um, because it's extraordinarily inconvenient for certain interest groups to talk about that. Because if you're talking about war in a landscape that has nuclear power stations, then it makes publics, particularly our publics, who have been involved in expeditionary wars for 20 odd years almost constantly, it would cause them to think maybe three times instead of twice or four times instead of three times about embarking on wars, particularly if there are nuclear power stations in those areas, because there is the threat of a Fukushima. Now, watchers of this programme will know about the Fukushima power plant and what happened. Uh, there was a meltdown uh, among, uh, you know, in terms of the reactors. There was potential clouds of, new, of radioactive activity. And recently, uh, there was a seminar uh, run by King's College London, the War Studies Department, actually, on this issue. And it's interesting that it's now they're talking about it. And there was a, a climatologist who had done a bit of work, and they showed a plume that went from Fukushima all the way across the Pacific to the Pacific, where, the, where, where, where you've got in Mexico and the United States, the plume potentially would have been that far. So therefore, if something goes really wrong in a nuclear power station, in a war zone, then the impact of the contamination goes well beyond the war zone. And we know that because what happened with Chernobyl. We know that there were um, sheep farms in the borders of Scotland where the sheep, after inspection, could not be put into the food chain yeah. uh, because of Chernobyl. So therefore, it's not that the nuclear power stations would cause the big mushroom cloud with the uh, firestorms and the like. It's the clouds of radioactive material that could spread well beyond the war zones. Can I ask something, Bill, because I was reading, um, oh. I can't remember. It might have been in an article in the New York Times. And anyway, the, the gist of it was, I mean, certainly wasn't saying that there was no danger and, you know, that, that there does need to be such a lot of care taken, especially around Zaporizhia. But they were also saying that um, the design of the nuclear reactors there is such that a Chernobyl type accident wouldn't happen. That's not to say that they couldn't get, there wouldn't be local effects, but there wouldn't be these further away effects. Um, I, I mean, do you know anything about, is that, is that the case? But King's College London have a war studies department and one of their staff himself moved into the war studies department, I believe, and he had originally, and he still is, a nuclear um, engineer. Yeah, yeah. And what I just told you about Fukushima, about the clouds. I learned that from the seminar that he conducted. 
and it's open source uh, seminar. Yeah. So if you've got a, an accredited nuclear scientist who's working for the War Studies Department of King's College London saying what I just said, um, you know, I consider that a reliable yeah. source. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I, I was when you said King's College London, I sort of, I immediately thought, well, that's going to be reliable. I, I suppose I'm just thinking there's also differences between, you know, a nuclear power plant, power plant that's on the coast, as many of them are, to, because of the cooling kind of uh, way that they cool them, and one like Zaporizhia, which isn't. Well, yes. it's on the it's on the river, of course, isn't it? Indeed, but the point yeah. about it is, it's a what the causes of the Fukushima meltdown was natural causes. Um, but we're talking about a war zone where yeah. we're talking about yeah. artillery, yeah. missiles and so on. Now, but it goes beyond that. Literally yesterday, you had, um, from the time we're recording this, literally yesterday, there were reports of shelling of the plant. And the Russians are blaming the Ukrainians, mm. and the Ukrainians are blaming the Russians. Again, there's a there's a sort of information war going on here, and again, credible sources will say that from time to time, the Russians will tell untruths, and from time to time, the Ukrainians will tell untruths. That's what countries do when they're yeah. fighting the war. Yeah. Misinformation is normal since you know since since. You know, for millennia, as wars have taken place, combatants will misinform. They'll misinform for a whole series of reasons. So I'm not blaming anyone for misinformation during a war. That's normal. That's what normally happens. But the question arises is, why would the Ukrainians um, yeah. shell it? Yeah. That's point number one. Yeah. It doesn't make sense. Also, it doesn't make sense, given the fact that the Zaporizhia plant is, you know, a few hours drive, you know, in a fast car, normal circumstances, a few hours drive from the Russian border. That doesn't make sense either. But we know that it's happened because there has been film of the explosions. I don't know what side is doing it. But what we do know is, is upping the awareness that yep. is there. Yep. I mean, I have a a vague theory as to who it is, but please understand this is based on nothing other than my observations, watching it in the news and you know open source stuff on, on, on YouTube. First of all, as I said earlier on, Zaporizhia is in the opposite side of the Dnieper from where the Ukrainians are. And the Ukrainians would be taken, even if they were doing it just to up the ante on it, they would be taking a hell of a risk of using artillery, even if they've got drone spotters across that power station. And by the way, the Russians will have, I would assume, the garrison of that power station will be well supplied and probably of a high quality. And I'll come on and say a little, a little about that in a minute. But I find it highly unlikely that the Ukrainians would do that. I don't know. I mean, I, if it's the Russians, I can only assume they're either being very irresponsible or they're deliberately getting military engineers and they're setting off explosions, inverted commas, the way that pirate technicians would do it in a movie set oh. for effect. Who knows? It's the only, it's the nearest thing to a rational explanation I can have that they've, you know, they've got the pirate technicians from Boss Film to go down there and set <laughs> off fake explosions. I don't know, but, the, but, but we're certainly getting the explosions. And what the effect that it is having is, people are seeing it. And it means that people are pointing out that there is a nuclear power station in the middle of a war. Now, early on, Chernobyl was um, occupied by the Russians. And then as the northern, this dash for Kiev, which is delusional in, in, in the part of, of Putin, and a huge intelligence failure of the willingness of the, the Ukrainians to fight, the Russians pulled off and that was that. And uh, there's another, a nuclear power, well, there's others, but he's, he, I think um, France and the Ukraine, I think, are the only two European countries where a majority yeah. of the electricity yeah. is supplied from nuclear power. There's one I think, near Mikhailiev, and when the Russians were apparently moving north to try and northeast to head for Odessa, that was in the path, and maybe the Russians were going to try and capture that one as well. 
But the idea that um, they haven't been planning for the capture of this power station um, a, is, an, is an incredible one. It's certainly incredible that the Russian staffs in doing the war planning wouldn't have been doing that. And indeed, although there's been no discussion, well, correction, there has been in recent years some open source discussion about the impact of a nuclear power station on a battlefield. There has not been that much, and certainly very little, if anything, in the mainstream media. And the first time I came across it was, there was, I can't remember, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, there was, in the city chambers of Glasgow, they were doing a reception for the 50th anniversary of Scottish City. It couldn't have been 20, well, anyway, they were doing a reception to celebrate the fact that Scottish CND had been in existence for 50 years. And they had a wee reception, you know, with coffee and sandwiches and, I don't know, a glass of wine or something like that, peanuts. <laughs> and uh, one of the folk who came along was a, a retired a general, Sir Hugh Beach. Now, Sir Hugh Beach is no ordinary retired general. Um, first of all, in his retirement, he often spoke uh, against uh, nuclear weapons. That's point number one. But point number two, part, during his military career as a general, at one point he was command, he was commandant of Camberley Staff College. Now at that time, higher education institutions within the British Armed Forces changed a little since then. But Camberley Staff College, for decades and decades, in fact, back in the Victorian period, I think, but certainly back before World War I, was the principal higher education institution where the British Army would send a middle ranking officers who potentially were going to become move into field rank. They would be sent there to do higher courses of military education. And he was the commandant of that. And I remember actually I saw him and I saw him out and actually asked him about, is there any work being done uh, in the open source? Because although he's retired, he can't speak about you know what, what's classified. Is there any open source um, work on um, the impact of a nuclear power station in, in, in a conventional battlefield, as I put it to him? And he said it was some. Yeah, but that was that. But actually, ever since, and I say my career was as a, a modern studies teacher and the teacher trade unionist, although I did international relations at university um, as part of my politics degree, but I never had time to really follow that up. And it's really only now that I'm starting to actually look in it in more granular detail. And it raises all sorts of interesting questions when you get into the detail. For instance, and this might seem a strange analogy but, analogy, but I'm actually going to use the Scottish Wars of Independence for this one. And it might seem strange, but there seems to be an analogy here. When the Russians capture Zaporizhia, right, what have they got? They've got a, a plant that no one can attack. And that is to say, if the Ukrainians yeah. attack it, it creates huge environmental problems for the Ukrainians. So they've got this, this castle, inverted commas, with <laughs> horrible walls that can't be attacked. Moreover, the Russians could put into that in the industrial complex, you know, in various parts of it, they could put very sensitive, very valuable military equipment. Yeah. That they know that couldn't be attacked. Yeah. So it, if you capture it, it immediately presents itself as a, as a, as a um, headquarters, an enormous and vulnerable headquarters yeah. that can't be attacked. So it becomes a very important um, place in the conventional war, if you see what I mean. You can yeah, yeah, yeah. It and yeah. it can't be attacked. But it gets worse or better, depending on your point of view, than that. Given the ranges, and we've seen this over this war, given the ranges of modern artillery. Now, way back in World War One, they had big railway carriage, you know, they had huge guns yeah. many, yeah. on big railway carriages. Yeah. They got in and even fired at Paris a few times, right? You know, um, the naval guns that could fire, 16-inch naval guns that could fire over the horizon, you know, you know, many miles just up to the horizon. Um, so they had artillery technology with a massive range. Now they have artillery technology. The guns are a little smaller, but they've still got those sort of ranges. And therefore artillery fire and the rockets as well can fire massive distances. So it means that, and we've seen that, because the Russians have used um, some of their um, missiles, which are designed to carry tactical nuclear weapons, I'll maybe come back to that in a minute, to fire conventional payloads into Western Ukraine. 
Um, but the point is, if the Russians were to put, they could put equipment, they could put artillery, and they could fire out. Now, I'm not just talking about what the Russians could do now, bear in mind. I'm talking about what could also happen in a future war where there are nuclear power stations that, you know, that are either there or have been put there because there's a solution to global warming. Because I do think, given the way and the influence of the nuclear industry, we may well see a proliferation of nuclear power stations. So although we've got the Zaporizhia example, and I may be talking mince in, in <laughs> to Zaporizhia, this doesn't mean to say that it couldn't be mince in, in, in another situation. Yeah, because yeah. That, you see what I mean? Yeah, that, I do. So, so it's like, it's like, and this is where the analogy comes in. Edward the Edward the First and Edward the Second, their armies were much bigger than the Scots armies. And when the Scot when English armies arrived, the Scots had to scarper or, or, or fight guerrilla warfare as, as as Wallace did, and actually as Bruce did as well. Um, and you know, very, very rarely would would Bruce want to fight a, a battle against overwhelming English odds. I mean, they would have literally hundreds and scores, you know, literally a couple of thousand knights. The Scots couldn't put together hardly any knights because they had no stud farms in Scotland to mount them properly. But the point is, what, what Bruce realised was the English could capture the castles and, and have bases and project a power. So if you, and, and this is something about Scottish castles, a lot of them were slated. That is, they were made habitable. Bruce ordered that we Yes, he destroyed them, didn't he? Yeah. But they couldn't be made, they, he would slate them so that they wouldn't be militarily defensible. And so the point is, a nuclear power station for an invader is a bit like a castle for an invader, like the Scottish castles would be for the English uh, in, in the Wars of Independence, or even the Morton Bailey castles that the Normans produced after 1066, because they weren't used as defensive structures. The Normans and their knights and warriors would occupy them, and then they would expand their military influence and dominate the area. So in a sense, Zaporizhia is a bit like a, a nuclear power station, so the potential to be a, a bit like a castle in that sense. When you capture it, you're the invader, the defenders have got to think, mm. and even the defenders, are they going to try and defend it? So if you've got, an, so you're in a country and you've got a nuclear power station and the attackers are moving towards your nuclear power station, you can't fight in the ruins of the nuclear power station the way you can fight in the ruins of a town. You can't do that. And at some point you've got to decide, right, quit, off we go and leave it. And it even gets more complicated than that because you can't shut it down. You can sort of shut it down, but because of the coolants that's yeah. required yeah. for the nuclear fissile materials and so on, you need to have an energy source. So your energy source is either by keeping one of the reactors going, or you've got to have diesel powered or oil, you know, oil, sorry, oil powered or coal powered or other powered um, electricity pumped into the power station to keep the coolant of machines operating. And so it becomes even more complicated because you're not just talking about the power station, you're talking about the power plants outside the power station that's putting in the power to keep it safe. Yeah. And, that's but, why and, they, and, and those power plants at the moment are being smashed almost every night, aren't they, by, by Russia? You know, well, that's the question. Yeah. I'm assuming that the Russians have thought, I mean, the Russians, I mean, all militaries, who have nuclear power stations will have done staff studies in this, you know, so none of what's happening at the moment will be news to say the staffs, the military staffs of most countries because they'll have done hypotheticals. Indeed, during peacetime, that's what a staff officer does. They do hypothetical scenarios, yeah, they spend yeah. their time doing hypothetical scenarios on absolutely everything. Yeah. And when they get trained, and I mean absolutely everything, because when Eisenhower was a, I think he was a colonel, a, a lieutenant colonel, in the American War College where he was being trained to be a general, he was given an exercise, and the exercise was drop a plan to invade Canada. But it was only an educational exercise, and you know, there have been conspiracy theories about Americans <laughs> invading Canada. But it was really Eisenhower and his contemporaries, it was part of the curriculum. So yeah. you will have had military staffs preparing and doing hypotheticals yeah. on how you yeah. defend a nuclear power station, yeah. when do you give it up, how soon do you give it up, and the International Atomic Energy Agency, quite rightly, 
are really concerned about all of this. And at the moment, I believe it's been agreed that you will have two IEAA, International Atomic Energy, staff permanently there. I mean, they do rotational. They're there for a week or two, and then and then they, you know, then, then others come in. And then you've got the issue of what about the staff and the plant? Now, about a week or two ago, it was announced that the Russians had the program it called it was kidnapped. Well, basically, it would be kidnapped the director, the Ukrainian director, and he resigned soon afterwards. And it was a report, I don't know how accurate it was last week in the press, that the deputy director was uh, kidnapped as well. But you've got the staff in the power station. They'll be kept there. Their families, if they're in the wee town, I can't remember, the, the, it's in the south side of the Nipah, can't remember of the, the wee town. Their families will be effectively held to a ransom. They'll be held to ransom to work there. And the Russians have then got to decide, do we keep the staff working in the plant? How do we treat them? What about the mental health of the staff? I mean, imagine yes, if you, yeah. you know, you, you, you've got a workforce who have to keep a nuclear power station safe and operable, but particularly safe. But they're effectively doing it as prisoners stroke hostages. How does that work? How does that affect their mental health? How does it affect their ability to do their job in Verti Commons properly? And then you've got the issue of is the occupying power, particularly if it's if the power plant is near its own border, going to set up some new way to transmit the power not to the Ukraine but into yeah, Russia? Into Russia. Know, things yeah. like that, who knows? Yeah. I've got a couple of th thoughts in my mind. What, the first one is um, sort of general point that presumably this war with the Ukraine and, and Russia is is the first time that this problem's arisen. I mean, mm -hmm. since the Second World War. I mean, I, I mean, there have been plenty of wars elsewhere, but I, I can't think of anywhere where there would have been nuclear power stations that, um, in a in a similar situation. But, but another question is: Is there scope for the Ukrainians taking over? Say that you mentioned the nuclear power station near Odessa making it a Ukrainian nuclear castle? No, no, there would, there, would, there would be no point. I mean, it would be completely irresponsible. No point in that, because uh, it really only, maybe it would, but uh, it depends how desperate the defenders are, but I don't think so. It really, right. this only, having a nuclear power station in your soil, if you live what, near a border of a country that is potentially aggressive to you, presents you, the owner of the power plant, with real security problems. It's not going to work the other way around. Yeah. Um, you're not going to be able to threaten your invader with the destruction of your own people. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it would, it would fall into the same category as mutually, you know, mad mutually assured destruction. Yeah, yeah, you know, I, yeah. I remember as a teacher, and one is allowed to teach these things, although I think there are huge challenges for teachers in teaching about the Ukraine conflict. Indeed, I'm going to a, a seminar in a few weeks' time organised by the Nuclear Education Trust down in the House of Lords uh, about the challenges of teaching uh, issues like this at this or, or issues at this time. But the other the other point was you mentioned earlier on about invasions. One of the things that we have become used to in the West, particularly in the last twenty odd years, is if you go back to since about certainly since uh, nine eleven and a little before. Um, we've been involved, that is to say, the United States, the United Kingdom, other allies have been involved in what I'll call expeditionary wars. Now, I won't go into the politics of them. I've got, mm -hmm. as folk could imagine, given Bill Ramsey, SNP, CND, you can imagine my attitude to these expeditionary wars. But I won't go into that. But the point is, as a, as a technical point, most of these wars were preceded by, a, were, by overwhelming force. In other words, the, the coalitions would spend months, or certainly six weeks, establishing air superiority. The, the Russians or the Ukrainians don't have that, but they would apply air superiority, which means they dominated everything. So although the war was going on, um, the inverted commas invaded, even if they didn't have the resources, were, were fighting a war with one leg and one arm tied behind their back, because the, the invader had air superiority. And under those circumstances, it is more credible for an overwhelming invader to put the, you know, the, you know, to sort of sanitise or avoid 
the nuclear power station area. That, that, that I would assume it would be a bit easier, but it still would present problems. Um, but in the current situation, where you've got two armed forces are pretty much balanced at the moment, because as military commanders often say, amateurs, observers, um, look at the manoeuvre and all the, and the fighting, while the professionals look at logistics. And as everybody knows, the reason the, the Ukraine is able, it's a population of 50 odd million, the reason it's able to fight on a pretty much balanced way with the Russians at this time, whether it will be balanced next year is another matter. But what the reason they're able to do it is because they have, they are, their armed forces have had high quality professional training from NATO for four or five years and um, lavish amounts of, of, of modern equipment. And also not so much modern, but getting a lot of ex-Soviet equipment from the um, ex-Russian equipment from the what were the Warsaw Pact countries, because that's what yeah. the Ukrainian. And yeah. you know, they get it from Poland, Czechoslovakia, yeah. the other ex baltic back state. They send them. You know, the Ukrainians are more interested in getting um, ex-Russian equipment than a lot of highfalutin um, Western equipment. And they want some of the Western equipment, but, you know, it's, it's that. So, yeah. Yeah. Do you think, I'm just wondering, do you think these sort of issues that you've been, you know, talking about around... Yeah, having nuclear power stations in the midst of a you know a war zone and the dangers of that. Do you, I mean, do you think that's a, one of the influences on these um, four-star generals starting to talk about you know we need a way out of this? We're going to start talking about a way out of it. Is that is that one of the things that would influence them? It may be. Actually, I don't know. Um, there's been some hypo hypotheticals because one of one of the features of being a chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the advice that you give to the president is meant to be, you give the president advice and you keep stoom. That's the idea. And that's what's meant to happen. Mm. The fact that Millie has given this advice, some of the, strangely enough, the State Department people eh, don't like it. Um, and the fact that it's out there that he's given this advice is in and of itself very unusual. Right, right. Admiral Mullen has been speaking about it because he's retired and he's been out of it for some time in that regard. He's free to opine about the situation and he said it's time for conflict resolution. There are various, again, it's difficult because when, you, when one listens to commentators, they're often, and I'm not talking about Ukrainians, I don't blame the Ukrainians for, a, as Bismarck called it, rolling the iron dice. But I live in Scotland, and these iron dice are potentially irradiated iron dice. Hmm. So therefore, we've got an interest in this with respect to the Ukrainians. So I understand where the Ukrainians are coming from. I can understand where the Russians are coming from. Uh, I'm not saying I agree with it, but I get, you know, where they both are in a war mode, and that's going to be that. So when you listen to commentators about why is Millie talking about conflict resolution, it depends on the provenance of the commentator. They may put onto that their own, um, the, you know, their, their their own position. I can I can only assume that, and maybe I'm wrong here. He assumes that there's going to be a, a deal, and most people are saying there's going to be some sort. It's going to, the war is going to end, and it's either going to end in conflagration, nuclear conflagration. Although a lot of people are poo pooing that, and if it happened, it would be through mistake. And maybe there's some things there about how the mistakes could happen. We saw the recent one about the missile that landed yeah. in, in Poland. Now, that Poland. missile was a simple, inevitable consequence of an aircraft fire. So the Russians have fired missiles into Ukraine, and Ukrainians are trying to defend themselves. And they fire a missile to shoot down the missile, and it misses. And it goes off course, and it ends up in Poland, and sadly it kills two to farmers. That's unfortunate. That's what happens. These are, these are the collateral damage. But the media, for the first 24 hours, went absolutely tonto. I mean, I remember getting the bus into town and there was a copy of the Metro, Russians fire missile at Poland. And various newspapers, Russians fire missile at Poland. Now, I'd heard about the, you know, the, the Russians firing the missiles into Ukraine. And I assumed it was a Russian missile that went wrong. 
or it had been a Ukrainian, you know, counter battery fire that went wrong as well. That was like pretty much obvious. And then, but the media went into because the military literacy of a lot of the commentators is not high, and the media went into sensationalists, and there was even media outlets talking about um, the Telegraph. And I think it was the Australian Telegraph. I'm not sure if it was the UK Telegraph. The Australian media went absolutely bananas about this. The Australian media in some ways were even worse because they're trying to whip people up into an anti-China frenzy. But the, the, the Australian media in some ways were, were, were worse than ours. They were, they, they were you know, talking about um, doing op-eds about um, the Russian invasion. Uh, sorry, the, 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 the Russians did invade Poland, of course. Um, but the German invasion of Poland, things like that, uh, NATO Article 5, I mean, I can't remember what the anchor was on a uh, BBC, it was Newsnight, and I don't expect the anchors in Newsnight to know everything, although they're presented as if they do, because they're meant to have production teams behind them, so they're presented as if they know everything. But whoever the anchor was that night talked about, uh, you know, does this trigger an Article 5? And of course, to pre tend to be in the end, she didn't then explain what an Article 5 is. That was her trying to be full technical. And uh, basically the Article 5 is where it's a trip, you know, it potentially leads to, you know, an attack on a NATO country means the other country jumped its defence. But then we're corrected by whoever was interviewing them. You know, it was an Article 4, which is oh. a consultation exercise. So immediately the temperature went up. And that's the sort of thing that can happen through a mistake. We can be certain that the anti-aircraft battery that fired the missile to shoot down the Russian missile didn't he want to kill two Polish farmers. It would be the last thing they would want to do. But you get mistakes happening. Yeah, yeah. And the other thing is the Cuban Missile Crisis. Remember, the Cuban Missile Crisis lasted for a number of, a number of days. I can't remember how many days it was. The, Ukraine, the war with the Russians and Ukraine is now into, you know, it's nearly a year. We're going into, well, we're, not, we're into... I don't know, day 270 something or other. And the longer this goes on, the more chance there is of a mistake. I don't expect Putin to launch a nuclear war. I don't expect the Ukrainians to provoke Putin into a nuclear war. But we can expect mistakes happen. That's what happens in what mistakes. Plans don't work. And it was General Wavell who was commander of British forces in the desert during World War One, World War Two for a period of time. He said on a good day, 60% of his orders were carried out. That doesn't mean to say 60% of his orders were carried out and were successful. They were simply just applied. No plan survives its execution. Exactly. Well. Contact yeah. So, so there's, the, the, there's going to be mistakes, mistakes all the time, collateral damage all the time, and something could happen that could trigger something else. That's the danger. Just listening to what you were saying earlier about it's likely there's going to be more nuclear power plants being driven by the, the climate crisis, which is only going to exacerbate the kind of situation you're talking to. That just occurs to me, if we're going into a period of advanced climate chaos and breakdown, the last thing you want all over your landscape is a whole load of nuclear reactors anyway, I would have thought. Are they not very vulnerable to floods and earthquakes and... Interestingly, in the seminar that was talking about, someone was talking about what about having you know floating nuclear power plants? <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly, <laughs> exactly. I mean, I don't need to say any more. Now, that 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 was a Q and A by a member of what? That, I think that was a question put by a member of the War Studies Department to the bloke who was doing the presentation. Now. You know, I don't. You don't need to have much military literacy to work out uh, the dangers of having mobile nuclear power plants. And of course, you know, you get into the absurd. You know, I mean, if you're going to have mo mobile nuclear power plants, you invade a country, you bring your own mobile nuclear power plant, and you set it up, and that's where your headquarters are. I mean, I'm being slightly absurd here, but it gets. You know, that the, 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 there are there are levels of things that need to be considered and i mean one another one is you've got the plant and i use the analogy of the castle right okay but that doesn't really quite work because it works to some extent to get the some of the to tease out some of the issues but how close to a nuclear power plant 
can belligerence in a war have a fight? Mm. You know, I mean, can they have a full on battle 10 miles from it? Can they have a full on battle five miles from it? At what point is a full on battle near a nuclear power plant not permissible? You know, when you get into issues of, uh, you know, issues like that. And of course, you know, if, if you've got a nuclear power plant in your right flank and your opponent has got the same on their left flank and they're deciding, well, we won't go near that plant. Well, well, we'll go within 15 miles of it. And the other side think, oh, well, we'll go within five miles of it. And that'll give us an edge. You see what I mean? Yeah, it gets yeah, really, yeah. really messy. Yeah. And that's one of the things that the International Atomic Energy Agency are worried about is how do we get rules to deal with this? Which brings us on, paradoxically, to the issue of conflict resolution. Now, in wars, different sides are talking to each other all of the time and maybe through intermediaries. Um, you know, Sweden was a familiar um, destination for behind the war talks, same as Switzerland and so on and so you know, non belligerence and things like that. So you've got situations where, um, where, where, where you've got places where talks can take place. And there are other areas where both sides have got to talk all of the time. One of the interesting ones, and I'm just talking about when two sides are in a war, continuing talking. We know that at various times, India and Pakistan have had wars. They've had flare-ups and wars. The major rivers, crucial rivers, that run through both countries, down from the Himalayas, mm -hmm. they have, there's a, I don't know sure what it's called, but they have a diplomatic structure and it's, in constant existence, whereby the Indian and the Pakistani governments are in communication all the time about the major rivers. Because the, the, India is not going to tolerate, um, because it's a much bigger power, it's not going to tolerate Pakistan, you know, building dams and things like that to stop these major rivers going into India. You know, there's water resources or water wars, but that's one. And so the Indians and Pakistanis actually have a committee or a, or a grouping where they're talking about it all the time. And even when they were fighting, this committee was still in existence. And over the issue of a nuclear power plant, one assumes through the offices of the International Atomic Energy Agency, there will be a team in the, a in the, in the IEA who are talking to Russians who are talking to Ukrainians and it will involve the specialists from both sides. So that sort of initiative, that sort of structure, if you've got that in existence, then you get the germ of being able to talk about other things, if you see what I mean. And as we know, early on in the war, uh, there were talks between the Russians and the um, Ukrainians. And then as the Russians thought they had the upper hand, they weren't they wanting to talk about it. And now the Ukrainians have got, a, you know, have got the tail between, you know, tails up, understandably. So maybe they're prepared to talk to some extent. And some, you know, there's theories from outside actors that, and I don't know whether this is true, that one of the reasons Boris Johnson went to, to speak to um, Zelensky was uh, to tell him, go to no day that. In other words, don't get involved in, you know, peace negotiations. But whether that's true or not, I do not know. And I'm sure with a straight face, the a new prime minister would say hey, that, 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 you know, that, that, that didn't happen with his predecessor and it won't happen with him. There are British companies um, who are promoting um, smaller, more efficient, cheaper nuclear power stations. Mm -hmm. Now, I could be wrong here, but I think one of them is BA Systems. I mean, with the EIS attended the... Um, was it 2018 or 2019, a trade union congress down in Brighton. I think it was Brighton, it must have been 19. And I went to a fringe meeting and it was sponsored by, I think it was British, uh, one of the British uh, commercial companies and uh, one of the unions 
who are involved, who are members in the plants in, in, in nuclear area. It might, be, it might be in prospect, I'm not sure. But there was a glossy brochure produced about how nuclear power could be made safe, how it could be built cheaper, and how it could be, it was mainly about nuclear storage, actually. It was about, um, you know, how, how to store the materials in safe places, in safe mm. geographical strata and so on. So there will be, there is a big push on in nuclear power. And that's why the last thing that the companies that are promoting nuclear power, the, the, the advent of, as I would call it, Castle Zaporizhia, they want that like a whole, they don't want to talk about it. They don't want it in the media. Because the more the ordinary people start thinking about Zaporizhia and applying it to different situations, the more difficult the sell of nuclear power mm. as a solution to climate chaos. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I must say I have my doubts about whether it's really a solution to climate climate change. It's a climate oh. chaos. I mean, especially when there's so much that still the world hasn't done with uh, with you know. Renewable, um, oh, yeah, renewable, renewable energy. Energy. Yeah. I mean, and quicker, cheaper. Yeah, I mean, quicker, quicker, cheaper, and yeah. it's not going to end up with uh, you know uh, polluted and uh, nuclear um, waste mm. kind of pollution. So oh. I know there's an event coming up, um, and the idea of getting Professor Paul Rogers, who is an emer emeritus professor of the Peace Studies Institute of Bradford University. Uh, Paul Rogers is uh, an internationally renowned academic on issues about conflict resolution. He also lectures to, you know, I talked about the military staff colleges earlier on. He also has done work, work with them as well about conflict resolution. And so Paul is doing a meeting, an online meeting on a, the 7th of December um, at 7 p.m. and it's online. And if you go to the Scottish CND website, you will, if you look down the events, you will see it there. There's also yesterday, um, Scottish CND got uh, the, event, the Eventbrite page for it. You know, they don't need to be a member of Scottish CND, though I encourage people to join, it's well worth it, um, to, enjoy, to join Scottish CND. And you can come along uh, and listen to what Professor Rogers is saying, because he is, you know, the real expert. I would, I'm just a, okay, I did international relations at university, but I was a, a modern studies teacher, which is related to this. And then a, then a union official for the last 13 years of my career. Um, a, he is a real expert on a, on these issues and will talk through how the actual avenues of how conflict resolution can be taken forward. And, you know, when, and if you've got a situation where, as I said at the beginning, the most senior military official, you know, the four-star general who chairs the Joint Chiefs of Staff Committee that advises the President of the United States is saying, is getting it into the, to use a Glaswegian term, going in all day that mode. Um, <laughs> you know, it's time to start to think about coming to a resolution because we're going to see over this winter many, many more Ukrainians and Russian young men and women dying we're going to see more civilians suffering. Um, and at the end of the day, there is going to be some sort of resolution. I mean, it should be remembered that, um, and again, not much talked about this, that uh, the man who was poisoned by Putin, Navalny, an opposition leader in jail, who is no supporter of this war, says clearly the Crimea is Russian. As far as he's concerned, the Crimea is Russian. That's someone that Putin poisoned. And if the opposition leader, like Navalny, is saying the Ukraine is Russian, then, you know, one sees that uh, claims by the Ukrainians that the entire of the Ukrainian state before 2014 is going to be back in their hands before they sort of fight. I think that's an opening negotiating position yeah. by the yeah. by the Ukrainians, but we need to start to look at yeah. the conflict resolution because then we're, we've not even touched the impact on the developing world in terms of uh, grain exports and other food exports. But it's not just the Ukraine. It, it used to be the breadbasket of the Soviet Union, but Russia itself is a massive exporter of, of foodstuffs as well, yeah. and that's very important in terms of the rest of the world. But the collateral damage of this war, 
We are seeing it as well in our energy pills. You know, we've got collateral damage. We know about collateral damage of wedding parties being killed by drones by mistake in Afghanistan and the like by ourselves. We are talking about collateral damage on a global scale that affects us and our energy, you know, our energy costs. There is that, and that will factor in as well yeah. at some point yeah. uh, as people, you know, find that they can't afford to pay their bills. Uh, that will factor in, and then they're going to say, "Why are we doing this? Why are we involved in this?" I'm not saying that the Ukrainians shouldn't be supported. I'm not suggesting that. I'm not going down that line. I'm not going into that debate. Indeed, at the Scottish Trade Union Congress, I moved the motion, the motion, uh, saying that we need to give the Ukraine a degree of material support. But that's not a, that's not a blank check that goes on ad infinitum. It's time to start to talk about a degree of, you know, so, some way of resolving this conflict. Yeah, so there are also ripples that maybe need to um, reach down into the, you know, the Russian population as well. I mean, I'm, I'm just sort of thinking, of, I mean, hoping that it's not overly optimistic to to think, well, maybe come next spring, I mean, the, the Ukrainians will have had a hard winter. There's no doubt about that, just in terms of, you know, the, 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 the uh, uh, you know, deterioration of their energy supplies. Um, but the Russians will also have had a hard winter. And the figures I saw the other day was that the, the official Russian figures is that something like 8,000 Russian soldiers have been killed. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, the, the estimates from elsewhere, Ukrainians, but not just Ukrainians, also the US is more like 10 times that number. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you would hope that once that the effect of that gets down into the, you know, Russian population, that maybe that's a bit of a, a, a swing factor that could, uh, you know, that could bring people to the, bring people to the uh, negotiating table. And, and, and yeah, maybe, you know, if it's Crimea, it ends up being the kind of crucial kind of chess piece um, then that, you know, that brings about a, a resolution that would just be fantastic. You know, on the one hand, Putin is recruiting, you know, he's put a call, you know, you know 300,000 plus. And uh, if we're talking, let's say 10,000 killed, then we're talking about multiples of that wounded and maimed. Likewise, the Ukrainians and the Ukrainians, mm -hmm. understandably, are keeping their casualty figures very close to their chest. But we know it's well into the thousands. And uh, we also know that one of the reasons the Russians eventually got out of Afghanistan was uh, the, the casualty rates that were taken there and the attitude of the mothers and the yeah. family. Yeah. And if large numbers of uh, young Russian conscripts are being sent home in coffins, then that will impact on Russian society. Mm -hmm. uh, and one has to hope that that will, uh, that the Russians will move away from, I mean, because in my view, Putin seems to have a somewhat delusional view of what a Russian is. In fact, it's, it's not unusual in the sense that Alexander III, the father of Nicholas, who was the one that was, you know, when, when the revolution took place under, Alexander III's view of what a Russian was is very similar to Putin's view of what a Russian is. And therefore, their view of what a Ukrainian is, is, you know, is, is simply delusional. I mean, whatever else they've done, by hammering the Ukrainians, they have forged the Ukrainians with, a, if it wasn't there before, a sort of new national identity. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And relationships all over Europe that are stronger than they were as well. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Wow. Well, as, as, as always, Bill, it's just um, highly educational to uh, mm. be ch sitting chatting to you, actually. I'm, I'm particularly taken with the, the, the nuclear castle image. Yeah, mm. I don't know if that's, maybe, um, maybe that's a touch of hyperbole, but it strikes me as if it's, it's, a, it's an opposite um, analogy. Yeah, yeah. Indeed. Yeah. Thank you very much for coming and updating us, and uh, no doubt you'll be back. <laughs> Sadly, it probably looks like it. But thank you very much. Thanks very much to Bill for bringing us up to date. I don't think I feel any safer than I did before, but I certainly feel better informed. And we'll put the 
link for that event that Bill mentioned in the notes at the bottom of this of this YouTube. See you later. Bye now. Bye.